Hi, everybody, and welcome to Microbiology. I'm your host, Mary Annarella, and we have left off talking about vaccines and viruses, and I just wanted to do a little bit of cleanup work. I left a note for myself here. Need to talk about influenza viruses. Page 559 is where this is at. So we're kind of bouncing around the book at this point, but I did want to talk about influenza, which, a.k.a., is also known as the flu. It is caused by influenza viruses. There are several different types of influenza viruses. There is influenza A, influenza B, influenza C. Okay. Influenza A, that's the most serious disease, and this is the one that causes most flu viruses. So we're going to be talking about influenza A virus. Okay, influenza A virus is an RNA virus. Sorry, why did I start writing rRNA? It is an RNA, has an RNA genome. Right, and it's it's kind of oval shaped, so I'm gonna sort of draw its envelope like that. And it's RNA genome in the middle. Uh, I shouldn't draw it all swirly like that. Let's get a different color. It's got several copies of its RNA genome hanging out in here. And it's got a couple of interesting surface antigens. One is, I'm going to go with, eh, eh, I'll go with hot pink. Why not? Okay, this looks like a spike protein. It's going to be similar to it, but I'm not drawing coronavirus here. Okay, this is called the hemagglutinin. Gluten in, not hemagglutin, hemagglutinin, also known as just HA. We'll just abbreviate it as HA. These are the spike proteins that let it in and out of the cell. It's kind of the lock and key thing. It's 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 basically the key that lets it recognize and get into the cell. into a human host cell. Right, there are some other proteins on here though. Let's I'll draw them like little little balls here. And these little balls are what we call neuramidase. Neur, as in neuro, neuramid, amid, ace. Or let's just abbreviate that as NA, like, like everybody does. Okay, now this, it's ace, so you know that's an enzyme, right? And that's an enzyme that allows new viral particles, new virions to be released from the host cells. Virions to be released from host cells. All right, now you get the flu, you acquire an influenza A infection, you know, when somebody sneezes near you and in and the virus gets in an aerosol and you breathe that aerosol in. It's very contagious. It gets inside your cells. So let's say this gets into you. Let's draw a person here. Happy, unsuspecting person, not wearing their mask. Um, let's give them some hair. They get the virus. Let's just do the virus in purple, all right? They give the virus to the next person. Unsuspecting person getting the flu. Okay, but 
as they do that, when it infects the first person, some genetic changes can be made, some genetic mutations can be introduced to the virus. Just slight genetic mutations. So this virus is gonna that infects the second person, and oh, let's give them purple hair now. <laughs> Got a mohawk. This is going to be a slightly different virus here. It's undergone some tiny genetic changes from when it infected person, person number one, person number two. Some genetic changes can occur as it infects this person's cells. They cough or sneeze on somebody else. Gotta love my stick people. Let's do something different with their hair. Let's give them curly hair. There we go they get the virus and now there are more slight changes so you see where i'm getting it's kind of like a game of telephone uh virus this influenza a virus is gonna infect lots and lots of people millions of people before next season comes around so just like a game of telephone that sentence is never going to be the same at the end, you know, a year later, one year and, you know, millions of infections later, the virus is gonna look a little different. Vi or the virus is very different. Or it's undergone several changes from person to person so that there might now be some slight differences to this spike protein, to this hemagglutin protein. And so now maybe it won't be hot pink. I'm gonna do it in a pale pink. <laughs> maybe HA looks a little different now. Or maybe the neuramid neuramidase is slightly different. But especially if this HLA looks a little different, you need a new, you're going to need a new vaccine. Because let's say that the vaccine we have was targeting the, the HA protein that looked like this, but now it looks a little different, a little different so that you don't get an immune response anymore. All right, so this is called genetic, or sorry, not genetic, my bad, because people tend to confuse the two. This is called antigenic drift. Antigenic drift. It, it's, it's a slight genetic variation it's, it's sl the accumulation that's right it's the accumulation of slight genetic changes to the antigen do you spell accumulate with i think it's just one m the accumulation of several many genetic changes that result in a different antigen. Antigenic drift is the reason you need a new flu vaccine every year. But there's something weird that also happens, something different and kind of weird that also happens with influenza A virus. Influenza A virus can actually, I'm gonna erase all this stuff here. Influenza A virus is unique, um, or rather different from influenza B and influenza C, in that influenza A virus can infect both humans and other animals, like let's say a sheep. humans and other animals. 
So let's say this influenza A virus infects a person. They get the flu, they are not happy. Let's change the color. What do I have for that virus? Gets the virus inside its, itself. But this could also infect, I don't know, let's say a sheep. Oh gosh, do you really want to watch me draw a sheep? That didn't work. I can draw a stick sheep. There we go. And the sheep can end. The sheep looks like a giant virus, doesn't that? It looks ridiculous. Let's say the sheep gets the virus. Here, I'll code the virus in hot pink. There we go. They can both. Okay, meanwhile, here's the weird thing that can happen. Let's focus on this right here, all right? Sheep can be infected by sheep-specific viruses too. So let me do, let's say this is a sheep-specific virus here. Gets in here. The influenza A virus and this other, you know, random sheep virus can infect the same cell and they can mix up their DNA like, like, whoa. And then what you get is this virus that's very new and very different. So I got to draw my sheep again. Draw my sheep a little bigger. I'm better at drawing sheep than cows. All right, but we're gonna get this m crazy mixed up virus now. It's new. This is a novel virus. A new virus that basically formed inside, inside a host cell by combining two different viruses. This results in major, majorly different um, genetic traits. So you get a whole new virus. It's a complete reassortment, right? This is not called antigenic drift. This is called antigenic shift that's happening here. So while antigenic drift, think of it as drifting. Drifting happens slowly, little by little. Antigenic shift, this is like a major paradigm shift thing going on. Antigenic shift is, is introduces a whole new strain of virus by causing multiple uh, very, very different genetic changes. All right, so you get, it's two or more different strains of viruses that combine. Combine in one host cell to form new viral strains. And this new viral strain could maybe infect humans too, all right? That's how you get these novel viruses like coronavirus. It results from antigenic shift, all right? Only this one was from bat, we think, right? Um, uh, coronavirus. Um, so you need to know the difference between antigenic shift, in which you get a very different viral strain, versus antigenic this is antigenic drift down here, which is just the accumulation of very small little genetic changes. And that's, but then that's why you need a new flu vaccine every year, but it's not gonna give you a whole new novel virus like shift will. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about that. And what page did I say this was on in your book? 559, yeah. Had it right here just so that I could tell you that. All right, so now we're moving on to the part of the book, and I have like around page 419 here. And also, oh, what chapter is it? Chapter 19, 
plus chapter 19, which is all about epidemiology. I can't spell epidemiology right now. I should, certainly should right now. But first I wanna shift over to page 419. 419 talks about this dude named, I don't know if it's Koch or Coke, like the Koch brothers, I don't know, but he was this dude who was a scientist in Europe. I believe he was Austrian. Don't quote me on this. I, I used to be able to tell you the story by viewing some notes, and I don't have that notebook is stuck at HCC, so I'm just going on the main points here. Koch was a microbiologist, early microbiologist. And he truly was brilliant. Um, he developed laboratory techniques for us. He linked microbes to human disease. Now others had postulated, like Pasteur had, had thought, you know, human diseases might be caused by microbes, but he wasn't able to link a specific microbe to a specific disease. Koch or Koch, I don't know how to pronounce it. I guess I should go with Koch, um, was the first to do that. So for example, he linked a mycobacterium to tuberculosis. He linked bacillus anthracis to, you know what this is, anthrax. Right, he won a Nobel Prize for one of these. I think it was this one. I don't know what year it was. That's the kind of thing that I kept in my little notes because I don't care that you know what year it was, but I wanted to introduce you to Koch. He's also the one who worked out a lot of culture techniques and sterile technique in microbiology. He was the first to actually use auger plates. I told you this story a long time ago, but you may not remember, he used to grow things on potato slices. And you can imagine how gross potato slices might be after incubating bacteria on them. And his wife was making some jelly and jam preserves and she used a, a seaweed substance called auger, which um, you know, is, is sort of like gelatin, only it's a plant product and not, not an animal-based product, but it's a thickener, right? And she was like, why are you using these potato slices? What if you use this auger stuff? like that, just add a little more to make it really hard. And so we have her to thank for his ending up using auger plates and going, you, my dear, are absolutely brilliant to suggest auger. So, and we still use auger today. Anyhow, how did he do this? How did he link a particular bacterium to a particular disease? Well, he set up a series of criteria that have to be met that we still pretty much follow today to be able to say, okay, it is, you know, coronavirus that causes this. It is this particular strain of bacteria that causes this type of infection. So without further ado, I give you Koch's postulates. So Koch's postulates are a set of criteria that need to be met in order to link a particular microbe to a particular disease. So let's screenshot this right here. All right, so first of all, he said, well, okay, the microbe, uh, why am I not on there? There we go. The microbe must be present in all cases of the disease. Gotta find it. Okay, and you've got to isolate that microbe from the diseased tissue. So it makes sense if a microbe is going to cause a disease, then all cases of the disease have to have it, and you have to be able to isolate it from the disease tissue. All right, and here is something that we would find very interesting today, the isolated microbe. Okay, so, so you find a bunch of people who have this disease, and you isolate the same microbe from all of them. Let's say it's this. 
the isolated microbe must cause disease in a healthy patient. So you take that and infect a healthy patient with it. They have to get the disease and then you have to isolate that same microbe from the experimentally infected patient. Okay, folks, <laughs> what's wrong with this? <laughs> How come we don't do it this way? This has got some limitations, major limitations. And, you know, I would like us to be thinking about these limitations right now. Got any ideas while I take a sip of my tea? Okay. We talked about in Zoom that you can't, uh, you can't deliberately infect a person with a pathogen. I mean, that's, that's, you can't do that anymore. No, that's, we consider that to be unethical. But here's what we have to do to get around it. We still have to see that a microbe does cause disease in a healthy patient, but what we do is we look for evidence of that through things like contact tracing. So instead, look for evidence of spread from an infected person to, an, to a healthy patient, right? We look for that through contact tracing. All right, I got an issue with this up here. Must be present in all cases of the diseases. All cases of the disease. Okay, so what are we supposed to do? Round up literally everyone who has COVID and, is and isolate from from their, isolate the virus from their disease tissue? I mean, what are you gonna do? <laughs> what about asymptomatic cases? Um, what about, how about you just can't get, it, you just can't find everybody who, who, all cases of the disease. So, you know, if we get to like, you know, 90% of people tested have this particular microbe. You know, like 90% of the people with tuberculosis had that mycobacterium present in their disease tissue. Well, then we're doing okay. Another issue, okay, uh, another issue with this that I have is that um, what if the microbe won't grow under laboratory conditions, All right? I'm gonna get out of this so that I can write now the screenshot. Okay, so some limitations of Koch's postulates. Okay, so you can't deliberately infect healthy people. We look for evidence of spread from infected to healthy people instead. Okay, also you can't find every case of a disease. And as for isolating it, isolating the microbe, what if it doesn't grow well under certain laboratory conditions? What if it only grows well in the body? What if it has special needs? Like, you know, what, what if it's a fastidious bacterium and it, a fastidious bacterium, which, you know, requires a lot of special growth requirements that, you know, we don't have in the broth that we didn't have in the broth that we tried to grow it with. You know, it might require certain things be added to its growth medium in order to grow in the laboratory. Um, what about viruses? Uh, we have to grow, a, we have to isolate a virus under different conditions than we do for bacterium. So viruses don't grow the same. Viruses don't grow in the lab under the same conditions as bacteria. Remember, viruses can only make more of themselves when they're inside another cell, when they're infecting another cell. So we have to grow them differently as bacteria, which if you just give them food, they'll grow in a broth medium, no problem. So that's a limitation too. So isolating microbe viruses don't grow the same. 
uh, bacteria, bacterial pathogens may or may not have different growth requirements that we can't that we can't uh, replicate in the laboratory. So let's take an example, an older example. Because I, I would use coronavirus as an example, but it, it's, the information is still evolving with coronavirus. So I want to look at a case from, let's change color here, 1976 in Philly. Okay, so the bicentennial year, 1976, I am probably the only one listening to this who was alive in 1976. But in Philadelphia, there was the, what's called the Bellevue, I misspelled that, Stratford Hotel. And they hosted a group of the, uh, they hosted a big um, convention of the American Legion. This was July. All right, and a bunch of people who had attended this convention started getting really sick with a high fever and it developed into a type of pneumonia. And a lot of people died from this. So this was this new mysterious disease. And it wasn't until January of 77. So what, five or six, five months later, six months later, that we had determined that it was caused by a microbe that we call Legionella pneumophila. So pneumonia, phila, phila for Philadelphia, I, I, I think, and also pneumonia loving. Legionella, based on the American Legion Convention, does anybody know what this is called? If you realize this is called Legionnaire's disease. I misspelled Legionnaire's. You know I'm a horrible speller, folks. I don't know. Are there two N's in there? I don't know. I'm a truly terrible speller. Notability should have a little red outline going, you misspelled this. <laughs> Yet we don't have that technology yet. Okay, Legionnaire's disease is something that actually still comes up every now and then. Let's get back to this. Okay, so Legionnaire's disease. Legionnaire's, it, it took them quite a while to isolate the microbe because it's got some funky growth requirements. Okay, it likes it warmer. It's got some special growth requirements. It's, by the way, it's a gram negative rod, but it's a stumpy rod. So it's, it's almost like a, a bacilli, bacilli cocci. So it's somewhere between a coccus and a rod. It's sort of like a, a, a bod, a bacilli, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like a bacchi maybe, I don't know. It's, it's considered a gram negative, it's considered a rod, but it's, it's short, sort of a short one. Uh, I believe it's catalase positive, it's urease negative, it's gelatinase negative, but it likes it warm and so warmer usually than 37 degrees C. So where does it grow outside the human body? It grows in very damp and wad under warm, damp conditions. So warm, watery conditions. And how is it transmitted? It is transmitted through aerosol. So tiny, on tiny water droplets. Now the fear with coronavirus is that it's carried on an aerosol, but it doesn't appear to be a strong form of transmission. Um, but aerosol, so it grows in these warm watery conditions. Often, okay, we already talked about why it's so difficult to isolate. Sorry, <laughs> I'm just jumping all over here. 
something, a bird just kind of flew into my window, so it kind of startled me. Anyhow, it grows under warm, watery conditions like the warm reservoirs that are in HVAC systems, especially big air conditioning, air conditioning units. So air con, rather larger air con units, such as in the Bellevue Stratford Hotel. Now, what's interesting about this is like, didn't you just say warm, watery conditions? Why would it be growing in an air conditioner? Aren't air conditioners cold? Ah, air conditioners work by removing hot air from your house, replacing it with cool air based on the freon that's been, been compressed. The cool air goes into your house and it sucks the hot air out of your house and blows it outside. So um, refrigerators work the same way. Only a refrigerator's fan is underneath the refrigerator, and that's why, like, you know, if any of you have a cat or like, that likes to hang out, like, at the base of the refrigerator in the win wintertime especially, because it's warmer down there, because it's removing warm air from inside the refrigerator and blowing it outside the refrigerator. Um, with an air conditioner, it's blowing it outside your house. If you go to an air condition, the back side of a window unit, you'll notice, if it's running, that you're getting some hot air by the fan there. So... Air conditioners, you get a lot of condensation on those warm coils, um, and the fan that the fan tries to blow that away. But as condensation forms on those warm coils, Legionella can grow there. It's not a problem with like a window unit, but it gets to be a really big problem in larger HVAC systems, such as for a whole building like that. It's also an issue with hot tubs. Um, sometimes it's an issue with, with large ice machines, such as in restaurants and the like. So that's one of the things that health inspectors for, ice, for restaurants look at. They check out the refrigeration. They check out the ice machines to make sure things aren't slimy in there because Legionella can grow. All right, I talked about why it's so difficult to isolate because it likes it a little bit warmer. It also grows slowly. in the lab. So it took quite a while there. Um, when Legionella is found, it's usually because someone has caught it, you know, at a place of work in an office building or at a restaurant that's a part of a larger building that uses a large HVAC. Um, and when this happens, the local health departments will come and interview a person and figure out everywhere that they went because they know that they need to clean out those systems. So this leads us into the field of epidemiology. Oops, no, it doesn't. I'm just looking that's a little, little different. Okay, never mind. I'm just, I'm just all over the place here, aren't I? So let's spend a little bit of time talking about how microbes actually can get in and establish an infection, all right? Because there are microbes out there. Yes, you have immune systems that, that take care of this, but you know, so how do they even get in in the first place? Well, first up, they gotta break through the skin or mucosa. That's why it's a big deal when you get a cut, okay? And uh, sometimes you got to put a band-aid on it or you got to clean it off with a little antimicrobial such as like Bactine or alcohol wipes or maybe someone will put a band-aid on you with a little bit of um, antibiotic ointment, Neosporin, triple antibiotic, whatever brand you use um, because we want to stop microbes from getting in you and a cut is a really good way to get in. Mucosa, it's easier for microbes to break through certain mucosa. Um, mucosa is fun fundamentally different. It's um, the, There's something about the columnar epithelial and also the mucus that tends to allow it in a little bit better, a little bit more easily. Um, then what they, so they have to get in you to get available to your cells. So 
they have to adhere to, they have to stick to, adhere means to stick to your host cell through what we call adhesion molecules. Adhesion molecules would be kind of like an antigen. So if we're talking microbe there, we've got these little adhesion molecules on there. And if your cells are, let me pick, let's see. Let's say this is a red blood cell or something like that. They have to attach to proteins on your cell. All right, so they gotta break through your skin, get through your first line of defenses. They have to adhere to your cells. Then they gotta grow and make more of themselves. after they adhere. Then they tend to release what we call effector molecules to the host cell that can cause changes to the host cell. So effector molecules, these are molecules that can cause changes within the host cell. So let's say they're molecules released by a pathogen that cause changes within a host cell. And these changes could be just about anything. It could cause problems with the ribosome. It could cause, cause the host cell to let in the bacterial cell, because some can actually do that. Um, they can be toxins. Exotoxins, is, it just really means the same thing as toxin. It's just a toxin that's released by, by a pathogen. So a toxin, it could cause just damage to a cell, but it comes in under the umbrella, the umbrella term effector molecules. All right, then they gotta evade your immune system. There are lots of different ways they can do that. So first up, and this is a common one, they can change their surface antigens. They can mutate slightly and change their surface antigens so that the antibodies that we make against them don't work anymore. They could bring proteases with them that actually cleave an antibodies. Now, if you remember, an antibodies are immunoproteins. And they've got long chain and short chain. They look like a Y. There are certain proteases that will cleave means to break them. So this is a protease right here. It can cut this up to bits, let's say. There we go. Ha, just gave gave a chop to that antibody right there. All right, so if they have proteases that will spe specifically cleave these antibodies, then we, the immune response won't happen. A lot of them can actually survive within a host cell. Sh oops, I'm on. Here we go. Shigella is one of them. And so is, oh, I believe, Neisseria. Neisseria, Neisseria gonorrhea um, can do that. They can survive within a host cell and avoid, um, you know, the full complement response that way. They can actually survive within uh, phagocytes, phagosome. What the heck does this mean? Okay, it just means they can live within an endosome. Meaning... Let's draw it this way. Uh, let's not draw it that way. Let's draw it here. Meaning, let's go back to red. If this is a human cell and here is the microbial cell, it means that they can have some effector molecules to, that let it bind to the cell. Let me draw it over here. Uh, no, no. combine to the cell and they can cause the cell to bring it in in the form of an endosome. Looks like an eye, 
an eye or something like that. This looks ridiculous. My artwork has not improved much over the semester, y'all. You know, here's here's the human cell. Let's draw some rough endoplasmic reticulum, some ribosomes here and there, Golgi, whatever, mitochondria. Some can survive within an endosome. Survive inside cell in an endosome. Endosome is just a more general term. There we go. So that, that's where it pinches off part of its own cell membrane. All right. All right, so so what? So a cell gets in, so a pathogenic cell gets inside your cell. Why does that make us sick? Well, sometimes it doesn't make us sick, but sometimes it does. But they cause disease by doing a couple of different things. They can release toxins. An exotoxin is just a toxin that's been released from a cell. So really just the term toxin works fine. Okay, so they can do that without colonizing you. Like for example, so without colonization. An example of this would be like food poisoning. Uh, so like for example, with um, different bacillus, different bacillus species produce a toxin. Um, that's often common with, um, you know, with rice that's contaminated with bacillus. Uh, that form end uh, bacillus forms endospores those endospores are still on the rice you cook the rice it bursts the endospores up the bacillus start um start to grow they produce an exotoxin that they release you eat the food and you've ingested the toxin and that makes you sick so that's an example of a microbe making you sick without colonizing you okay they can still colonize you and then release toxins there are a lot of different bacterium that would do that. Um, so the one that causes tetanus, for example, colonizes your cells and then releases a toxin. I just wanna get rid of this word exo. It's really a misnomer. All right, they can invade your tissues um, and cause a lot of inflammation and cell damage that way. Oh, and of course, they can invade tissues and release toxins to you as well. So any combination of these four things here will work. All right. So you just need to know a couple of examples of how microbes evade the immune system and how they actually cause disease, why they cause disease. Um, let's use Lyme disease as one more example as well. We're probably all familiar with this. Um, it's caused by Borrelia <laughs> bugdorfii. It's a gram-negative spirochete. A spirochete is that thing that looks like a little piece of fusilli pasta or something. It's like a little spiral thing. Um, it's transmitted by deer ticks. You know that. And you get bit by the tick, and the tick serves as a vector. The tick a vector is something that carries a disease from one, from one host cell to another. And in this case, it goes from deer to tick to you. So the tick carries it from the deer to you. It is a vector. It's a vector. All right. It's got three stages of infection. So we're doing Lyme disease. So the first stage, you probably know what it is. You get that bullseye rash. The one that at the point of the bite, if the bite was right in there. Tends to look like 
that. Now, this is also a problem, too, because I think only I read somewhere and I need to. Oops, I got a low battery. <laughs> only about 80% of infect, uh, in Lyme infections actually show the rash. So that can be a problem. You don't have that bullseye rash, you're not going to suspect Lyme, are you? So this is the early part of the infection. It's just very localized. Um, but if things get to a second stage, if it's not treated with antibiotics, then you can have some other symptoms that affect the nervous system. So let's say the nervous system is affected. You can get heart arrhythmias. Oh gosh, don't ask me to spell arrhythmia. I did it. I did it. I'm so proud of myself. You can get heart arrhythmia. Um, you can get headaches, paralysis, um, fatigue. The paralysis, I believe, is um, often on the face. You get fatigue. And then a late infection, about, you know, often six months in, this is more like a chronic fatigue and joint issues. So it's more like a chronic fatigue syndrome, really exhausting. And here's why it's so hard to treat in the latter stage. In the latter stages, um, Borrelia is very slow growing. And here's the deal with that. Antibiotics target actively growing microbes. Generally, target actively growing microbes. You know, it'll interfere with, with their ribosomes or it will interfere with production of peptidoglycan. But if this microbe isn't growing fast, if it's not wanting to divide, it doesn't need to make more peptidoglycan. So in the late stages of the infection, the microbe is very slow going, so antibiotics are less effective. So take home message, you got to find, you got to treat it at, at, um, at best, stage one. Stage two, it's still not, it's not too slow growing, but really you got to, you got to get it as early as possible. So antibiotics are most effective up here. And why we in the north, with how prevalent Lyme disease is in the northeast, I'm still shocked that we have no Lyme vaccine for it. Um, and from what I have gathered from people I know who are in the business, say that there's no money in it anymore. Um, that people, that there is a vaccine for dogs. There was a vaccine for Lyme disease, but it was kind of at the height of anti-vax fervor, uh, and they just decided to screw it. We're not going to make enough money off of this, um, you know, because some some folks had said, oh, you know, we had some sort of strange side effect from from this. But it really, I would really love to have a Lyme. Lyme vaccine, especially for up here. I know so many people who are infected from it, and it's not just, you know, people hiking out in the woods where the deer ticks are. Um, people have been bit by ticks, you know, in the stop and shop parking lot and developed a bullseye rash for it. And if it's not caught early, a late infection can be debilitating. So you gotta treat it early. And I am going to leave you right there for right now.